The Clean Energy Resource Teams project, launched in 2003, connects citizens across the state with the technical resources they need to identify and implement community-scale energy efficiency and clean energy projects. A growing number of Minnesotans envision an energy future built on using energy wisely and generating energy from local renewable resources like wind, solar, biomass, and even hydrogen. The film you're about to see was created by the Central Region Clean Energy Resource Team, or CERT, to highlight some of the extraordinary energy projects happening right here in our own communities. My name is Mike Kovakovich and I'm the manager, the park manager here at Itasca State Park. Uh, this story starts with uh, our site selection and, and actually a little earlier than that when the decision was made to new, make a new Mary Gibbs Mississippi Headwaters Center. Uh, it was done because the old facility was about 45 years old and, and not adequate, had some maintenance issues. Uh, but also we needed to do a better job of interpreting the site here, telling the many stories of the Mississippi headwaters, and we wanted to be able to do that year-round. So that drove the project where the uh, interpretation could be viewed uh, every day of the year, even though most of our visitors come during the summertime. Every day we have people that visit the headwaters here. Uh, we moved this facility further back. Uh, the facility actually sat about 100 feet uh, to my right, closer to the river. It was within the impact zone. And so we wanted to move it further out. We also did not want to impact any of the archaeological site that is found here. So we did all of the building within the areas that had already been impacted. We are, in fact, where we're standing used to be part of the parking lot. We reduced the parking lot size, pushed three quarters of the building out into the parking lot, redid the parking lot, and one of the things we included in that was stormwater retention or stormwater ponds, so all of the drainage gets filtered before it ends up in the river. We also recycled the uh, bituminous, that became part of the parking lot, and then we used uh, native vegetation, all of the planting, which is still ongoing and in progress, is all native vegetation. We also utilized as many of the trees. We took out very few trees in construction of this site, some smaller ones, on the edge of the parking lot here where the building is, but we're utilizing the trees and then with the plantings for shade for energy efficiency in the summertime and some protection from the wind in the wintertime. So those were all part of the natural environments that were uh, used in, in the sustainable part of the design for this facility. All of the outdoor lighting is, is and all the lighting in the building is high efficiency lighting. It uses motion sensors and light sensors and timers, so we don't have lights on up here when there are not people around or in the middle of the night. This part of the park is only open till 10 p.m., so we don't, we have very minimal lighting. Also, the lighting is all directional down, so it does not uh, put light into the night sky. This is one of the sites our naturalists use for uh, stargazing programs during the course of the summer, and we didn't want to add any more light and, and impact their ability to see the stars, which is one of the wonders of, of the park out here without all of the light. The building itself is about 6,000 square feet, but it also has uh, 2,000 square feet of what we're standing underneath here that is covered, and another about 600 square feet of open covered space for outdoor seating for the dining room. Um, the idea of, of utilizing the outdoors was for that interpretation that is spread all around here could be used year-round, and also it's a lot cheaper construction, less materials, less maintenance and upkeep uh, uh, to go about it that way. All the construction is modular construction, uh, meaning that everything is in four and eight foot increments, so there is minimal waste on, on materials during construction. All of the lumber is sustainable lumber. We have, uh, like the decking here is uh, FSC certified, all of it's certified. We have glue laminated boards. We have recycled product in here. We have agricultural composite boards that are made of wheat and uh, sunflower seeds. Um, and all of the plywood and decking is also certified. Uh, in fact, one of our uh, displays here talks about the building itself and the sustainability of, that, of this building and the materials used. We utilized a lot of concrete. There's no con um, uh, carpeting in the building and quarry tile, all long-lasting materials. Shouldn't need to be replaced for many, many years. The concrete incorporated fly ash for uh, strength. Uh, and then it also serves as, as a heat sink uh, inside the building so it does absorb some of that heat energy and retains that to lessen some of the energy needs. 
R value is uh, is a number that they use. The higher the number, the better insulating quality is is found in it. The R value on the roof is an R40. The walls are R29, and all of the glass is a high efficiency argon filled windows. So we have a very good uh, R value in all of that. Also, the windows are operable. Uh, so on those days where you really don't want to turn on the air conditioning, you can open the windows and use the natural ventilation. Uh, the air circulation system within the uh, building is also efficient. We recover the heat from that and use that in, in heating and cooling the building. <coughs> and the furnaces and com compressors for the air conditioners are all high efficiency also. Our uh, domestic water system here is a efficient, high efficient system, and starting with the, the way we heat the water in the water heater itself. But also we temper the water in the restroom so uh, and it's when you go to use those sinks and stuff, that water is um, set at a pre-temperature so we don't have high water, high temperature water or low temperature, it's always the same. And it's a recirculating system so it lessens the demand where you don't need to run the water as long to get it up to that warm temperature. Also from a water um, efficiency, standpoint I mentioned earlier, we have no irrigation system here and that was part of the native plants and again to lessen the need to pump water and, and disperse it. When we started discussing the uh, dining room aspect, we, we were very interested in using real dishes and a dishwasher because we didn't want to add things to the waste stream, all of the disposable products. In our research and in working with the architects and consultants on the project, we also found out it was cheaper from a labor standpoint or overall cost standpoint to have that dishwasher and someone doing the dishes that you're reusing than using the disposables. So we incorporated that. Also, all of the dining room furniture, the tables, the chairs, both inside and outside, uh, were made by a local craftsman about 40 miles north of here with uh, almost all uh, native materials, sustainable materials again. And uh, the sustainable lumber is a real important thing to us here at Itasca, but also to the department. Uh, our department under the uh, commissioner's office and then our division of forestry is currently finalizing, certifying all of Minnesota State Forest to sustainable products which will help us down in the future. So we wanted to be part of that. It's a big push in the department, but we felt it's a real important here at Itasca. The sustainable lumber, what that means is that, that those trees are grown and harvested in a fashion that new trees and everything will come up from that. So it's a renewable resource uh, that we're not going in and cutting old growth and then just whatever happens, happens. It's uh, a planned for system where when when we're cutting the materials out, there's a plan to have new trees, uh, new product growing in there, so it sustains itself over time. Now granted, that cycle can be vary from 20 to a couple of hundred years, depending on the type of timber, but it's important that we're uh, treating the forest and, and making sure that when we take materials from it, it's still a healthy forest, and the sustainability is all about healthy forests. And then the last thing, and we have recycling centers spread throughout the uh, parking lot for the public and here on the plaza. We also do recycling of all of our cardboard, uh, uh, things that food products or the gift shop items come in. So all of that's recycled too uh, here at the park and we have a recycling center, big one here behind the building also to take care of that. My name is David Winkleman. I'm the director of the Water Foundation. We're a conservation organization out of Brainerd, Minnesota. And we're trying to teach people the good sense in harmonizing with nature and cooperating with nature and learning nature's lessons. So even though the, we're the Water Foundation, we're teaching people the practical ways that they can reduce pollution in their homes and also save money in the process. Today we're gonna talk about uh, three different types of technologies that you can use in your homes that are simple, money-saving, and practical devices. Uh, the first is a wind turbine, and we have a 4,500-watt wind turbine out here. The second is a series of geothermal heating and cooling systems where we're using the energy of the earth plus a little electricity to do the heating of the buildings and the cooling of the buildings in summer. And third, we're going to talk about the composting toilets that 
retain all the pollution and don't put out any pollution into the environment and yet create a product, uh, black dirt, that's a soil a nutrient and amendment. Wind turbines. I used to call them wind generators till one person asked me how much wind does it generate. And I said, well, <clears throat> it actually is a wind turbine. A turbine is turned by the wind and the wind is free fuel. There's free fuel up there going by us every day and if we put a turbine a rotor into the wind and catch that free fuel that can make electricity for us. And now there are incentives so that people can afford to put in wind generators. Uh, there's tax incentives and production incentives and the price of electricity is going up a little bit every year. So there's money in the wind. And I think that we need to put the wind to work. Geothermal energy is actually solar energy. The earth captures the sunlight energy and stores it down up to 200 feet deep into the earth. And what geothermal contractors do is put in earth loops of one nature or another to gather that ambient temperature of the earth and use it to trigger heat pumps that actually produce heating and cooling through compressors and circulating pumps. This is the header for the geothermal system. We have four sets of geopipe, each are 600 feet long. This one's 12 feet, this is 16, 20, and 24 feet underground. And w the fluid circulates through there and draws the, the temperature out of the earth and then brings it back to come into the heat pumps. It's actually a fairly simple process where we simply take a fluid and circulate it through 24, 2500 feet of pipe that's in the earth. And as it goes through, it perhaps gets five or six degrees warmer in the wintertime. And that five or six degree delta T is enough to trigger the heat pump and run the cycles for heating and cooling. So here we have two types of heat pump systems. We have a closed loop where we have that 2,400 feet of geopipe in the earth. It's actually underneath of our pond. We dug a pond and put the geopipe in the bottom of it at four different levels. Then the other type of a system we have here is called an open loop where we pump water from a well in the earth that actually drains into the pond and helps keep our fish alive. We have sunfish and crappies and a little fish farm out here and our geothermal pump keeps the fish alive. This pond behind me here is the end of our geothermal system or it's the beginning of it. We have that 2,400 feet of geopipe laid in the base of the pond at the different levels I explained before. So that's called the closed loop system. And the open loop system comes out here where the water is exiting from the well in the building. Composting toilets are very interesting pieces of technology. I've been selling them for about 10 years now and it's really fascinating talking to people about their toilet systems. Most people don't want to talk about it, they don't want to think about it until there's a problem. We happen to like composting toilets uh, because they do the same thing that nature does and that is turn you know, our excrement into a useful product for the earth. Well, so we've actually named our composting toilet here because it's a working ecosystem. It's one of the hardest working members of our staff. So we call him Phil. So we feed Phil uh, every day. This is the compost chamber. This is where Phil lives and works hard every day. And the compost comes in from three uh, bathrooms upstairs and falls into this large chamber where it's mixed with the toilet paper and sawdust and eventually produces black dirt. As you can see here, this again is the result of nine years of use and about 58,000 uses. And yet there's nothing we've had to take out. After nine years and 58,000 uses, we have about a foot of black dirt in the compost chamber. Well, the composting toilet here is just like a regular toilet. It just has a large chute that goes down, but there's no flush, there's no water. So there's no condensation dripping in the summer times. There's no place for bacteria to form. So there's no pollution and there's no smell. The smell in the bathrooms is taken out by a fan that's running all the time, drawing the air out down into the chute of the bathroom and out of the building in a stack. That takes the moisture out and the smell out of the toilet. This is a smaller version of a compost toilet. This one's big enough to handle a family of four. 
and we named this one Phil Jr. You can hear a motor running there. It turns the compost with a motor inside of stainless steel arms and grates. So the other one works on a gravity principle, but this one has an electric motor in it. Okay, this is our power center. We have multiple power sources on the premises here. We have the power company, then we have the solar power and wind power. And that's where they come in. And then the solar and wind, which is DC current, comes into a voltage regulator where it's then charged into the batteries. And from the batteries, it comes to the inverter. And the inverter is what turns it into AC power to power the, the building and the lights and everything. This is the brains of the system. It's pretty much uh, foolproof and simple. This whole system causes us to be a power company. So now, as a power company, we generate our own power, and we work with our local power company to sell the power to them. So when we're making more power than we need, it automatically feeds back into the power company and gives us a credit on our meter. And here we have some of the latest technologies in solar panels. This is the future of solar where it's integrated into the building. This is actually a peel-off stick-on back where this goes right over the top of a metal building roof or other smooth roofs. And this is a solar shingle where when you replace your shingles, you can replace them with solar panels so your roof becomes your generator. The Water Foundation is an educational campus located east of Brainerd in a set of buildings we call the Ecodomes, where we have all these technologies here for people to come out and see and touch and look at the dials and the numbers and actually walk through a sustainable building complex. And in addition to visiting us, you can also go to the internet and take a virtual tour and go through several hundred pages of information, practical things about what you can do to reduce pollution in your home, not only with all these great technologies, but things like compact fluorescent light bulbs and low flow shower heads and very practical things that we can do with our homes and our vehicles are all available at our website called thehopshop.net. Hi, my name is Earl Willett. I'm the Director of Buildings and Grounds with Brainerd Schools. Uh, we're here at Riverside School. Uh, we have gone through uh, a number of upgrades in the school and uh, we've done this uh, for a number of reasons. The high cost of energy uh, is something that we at the district have been very uh, cognizant of and uh, lately the cost of energy has gone up even higher. These costs, along with the need to improve air quality for our students, uh, have really driven us to these projects which uh, uh, we've done at uh, this school and uh, other schools around the district. In the year 2000, the school district uh, and the superintendent, uh, Jerry Walseth at the time, had some visions of uh, improving the learning environment for the, uh, for the school district of Brainerd. Uh, one of the things, we, we were brought in as a partner, Johnson Controls, to, to look at uh, the quality learning environment that existed at that time. And they saw that they could have a significant improvement to the learning environment with indoor air quality improvements. So one of the things that they want to do is not just bring in more fresh air for the school, but do it in a way that's cost effective for the district. There are studies, uh, many studies that show both that a poor indoor air quality has a detriment, in, uh, detriment to a student's ability to learn and a, a good quality learning environment, good lighting, good, good uh, natural day lighting, um, nice and comfortable workspace uh, has a positive effect on students ability to learn. We've replaced the uh, old uh, uh, air handling units, the univents that we had in the classrooms with uh, modern computer controlled air handling units. We've added occupancy sensors in the classroom to turn lights on and off. Uh, we've added uh, heat recovery wheels in the units to actually save energy. We've had some uh, history on energy savings with the heat recovery we wheels uh, at Nisswa School, for instance, uh, the first year we ran those, we saved 48% in our gas bill. Here you're looking at uh, an example of a heat recovery wheel, and the spinning of the wheel is uh, allowing us to take the heat that's generated inside the building from the lights, the computers, the students, uh, the staff, as it extracts and leaves the building, this heat, through this heat recovery wheel, 
puts the heat back into the fresh air, incoming air into the space. This is an example of an air handling unit that was put into a storage area. We have two ways that we do this. We either put them in a storage area or an area that's not being used as a classroom or we mount them on the roof of the building in their own enclosure. This is a, uh, this is a modular self-contained air handling unit that uh, replaces the unit ventilators for approximately 14 classrooms. And uh, the uh, nice part about this unit, it doesn't occupy any classroom space. Here's a, another example of a heat recovery wheel. The way these units actually work, the desiccant in the removal of water from the air actually takes heat along with it and transmits that heat into the uh, uh, incoming airstream from the outside. Because we've incorporated dehumidification into the systems so that we can maintain a, a relative humidity level inside the building at 50% relative humidity or less. What that means is the ventilation systems are actually drying out the school making sure we're not bringing in moisture on those hot humid days where an air handling system that we bring in a lot of CFM or fresh air will be bringing that hot humid air into the building which could cause mold growth inside the facility. So by having the dehumidification types of systems it allows us to continually improve the learning environment and, and reduce indoor air quality issues. The installation of the dehumidification systems uh, not only improve the air quality for students and staff but reduce the ability for mold to grow in, in these spaces as we control the relative humidity to 50%. These units being self-contained uh, allow us to get in here in the winter time if we have a, a failure on anything to make any repairs, to do any uh, filter changes uh, or any other type of maintenance uh, and also protects the units from the environment. As part of the units they all have different filter systems. We've got a high level filtration so we're filtering that fresh air that's coming into the school to make it even more fresh. So in a lot of cases, uh, the air inside the building is cleaner than the air outside the building. The other thing that we've incorporated in our projects is airflow measuring stations to validate and verify the amount of fresh air that is coming into the building. And that information is relayed back to the computer system. The school facility is, is set up with dehumidification as well. And one of the, the specific things that's unique to the Medicine system is what this is is a comfort chart. And we're, we're at the school today on a Saturday, uh, so the kids aren't, aren't here in, in the school today. What this chart shows is that 90 some percent of people are comfortable when they fall within this, this red, red area. So you can see the cluster of classrooms right now are at a, a certain relative uh, humidity as well as a certain temperature inside the classroom. And this, this one right here happens to be the room we're in right now, which is the maintenance office, which is right next door to the boiler room. So you can see how it does get warmer in this room uh, because, of, uh, because of being close to the boiler room. We've got a program called the Medicis program that Johnson Control has introduced into the school program and a training program for the engineers and custodians. It's a program that we watch a computer daily and periodically during the day. Click on the map of the school and you'll get the readings of the temperatures in each and every classroom and office. You can maintain almost any aspect of the air handling system from this controlling. That have this system uh, feed to my computer in my office so that I can uh, look at every classroom that's on the system in the morning when I come to work and see that uh, all the classrooms are within their, within their operating parameters and if there's any problems then I can see those as well. And this is an example of a classroom with the occupancy sensors. As you notice, we walked into the classroom, the lights came on. Um, these lights will stay on for approximately 30 minutes after the students go out. Uh, also, you can see we have uh, new lighting in this classroom. Uh, this is a high energy efficient lighting. We have a uh, new air system. We've got the diffusers on the ceiling, which uh, deliver the air nice and uniformly to the areas in the classroom. The main medicines computer actually controls these thermostats and allows four degree adjustment for the teacher uh, when she's in the classroom. This building goes into night setback at approximately seven o'clock at night and the heat will be turned down automatically to 64 degrees throughout the building. If someone would want to come in to use this classroom after hours they could actually set this uh, reset this button on this thermostat and would give the uh, teacher, whoever be operating, operating in this room, 
an hour uh, of, uh, of uh, heat in that room, and, and then it would reset itself the night set back. So these are the, some of the things we've done. Uh, we've got uh, feedback from uh, students and, uh, and teachers that uh, by reducing the uh, amount of CO2 in the classroom, where we've had as high as uh, 28 to 3,000 parts of CO2, now we're down to 1,000 parts of CO2. The kids are much more alert. They go home alert. And it's, uh, it's uh, being proven that, uh, that their ability to learn has been quite improved healthier children. It's just created a better environment all through the school system. I want to emphasize uh, that these systems are very reliable. Uh, we have a very good uptime on them. They do a really great job. The installation of these systems has uh, not only helped the students and staff at Riverside School and the other schools where, where we've installed them, but it also has been a great benefit to the taxpayers. Uh, these systems are very great energy savers. In some cases we've seen as high as 45 to 50 percent energy savings where we have heat wheels installed. We worked with the district to cut their costs for off-peak electricity, uh, make sure that the windows are not drafty, and other energy areas that we, were, we dealt with during, this, during the project. And this uh, allowed the district to maintain a large savings. All in all, uh, the systems are a great benefit to the students and staff at Brainerd Public Schools and also a benefit to the taxpayers because we are reducing energy costs while at the same time improving air quality. One well, of the big challenges schools face continually is not enough funding to be able to do these types of improvements. One of the things that our job is is to help schools find that funding and a lot of times you do find it in wasted energy use uh, resources. So you can see here we we're able to save a lot of energy, a lot of dollars that get reverted back into the classroom into some of the extracurriculars and some of the other educational funding uh, areas that are short and continually are needing more money. Hi, welcome to Hunt Utilities Group. We're really proud to um, have you here so you can see and understand a little bit more of what we're doing. At this point, Hunt Utilities Group is focusing in on energy, alternatives. We're looking at sustainable living, which is we want to be able to use what we grow and grow what we use concept. We were looking at roots and wings because it's an old concept. These roots are made, sculpted out of the same plaster material that's on the walls. One day our artist was, was actually working on the window and he made something that looks a lot like roots and it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. and I walked in and I was just marveling at it. We feel that we're building the roots here for a new way of trying to live, which is actually an ancient way, going back to very old uh, paths of living closer to the earth. We also want to try using some of the old technologies, which is the cob and the straw bale, and create these kind of neat houses to live in. Cob is one of the oldest building materials ever used. Cob is a mixture of clay, straw, sand, and water. It can be used both in the dynamics of uh, preserving thermal energy as well as uh, have great artistic feel to it. We want to show the world that building things out of straw and mud can actually be, be gorgeous. The works that you see here were created by uh, Peter Anderson. He demonstrated how elegant cob can be made. Our campus is probably different from any campus that you'll, you'll visit, at least in the state of Minnesota, where we're, we're looking at energy, we're looking at environmental housing, we're looking at being able to live and sustain our lifestyle close to the earth, but we're also an education facility, we're a business incubator. And the design behind this uh, is to try and uh, bring people to our campus who have a shared interest. Our business incubation, for example, uh, is specifically set up so that those who are interested in solar, uh, wind, thermal, or even food production in an organic manner would have a place that they could come to and work with us and learn from us. We want to prove to the industry and the rest of the world how it works. And of course, we want to know that ourselves. So, so we've installed hundreds of sensors, moisture sensors and temperature sensors. This building is actually a research lab. Every aspect of this building is something that we're studying. We're studying the performance of the cob, the performance of the, the straw. Uh, we have hundreds of monitors throughout the entire building monitoring 
airflow, air temperature, uh, humidity. And the key reason is that we want to be able to build homes that are highly efficient, but also very elegant. And so in the environment that we're in right now, we have the ability to track temperatures uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we can access that and control it on the web. I think a house should ha ha hate itself. It sh shouldn't be a huge sink to suck up all your dollars. This building is designed in such a way that we've got uh, three foot by three foot by eight foot straw bale uh, structure. So it gives us an R value of 100. The ceiling has an R value of 100. In the standard home, you generally have uh, six to 12 inch walls and an R value of maybe 20 to 30. But the way that we designed the building, the awning sets out seven feet. The overhang on the south side of the building is very important. Uh, in the summer, when the sun is high and overhead, it uh, blocks the sun from the windows. In the summer, or in the winter, when the sun is low and to the south, it shines in all the windows, allowing us to collect as much heat as possible. So we can capture optimum solar energy, uh, passive solar energy, in the wintertime, and yet in the summer, we, the, the shade casts perfectly right at the foot of the building. So the, uh, the design of it was very deliberate uh, to capture every, every bit of solar that we can. The other, the other element that we did that I think is very important is we created a heat sink. The, the heat sink was designed before we put up any of the walls, and it's, it's trenched air that, that takes the air from the top of the building, brings it down into the ground, so we are capturing all of the warm air that circulates around. Uh, the way the building is designed, the warm air heated by the bodies, the electricity used in the building, and the sun coming in the windows, uh, rises up to the point up at the top. What we do then is we take the hot air, pull it off the top, down along the windows, and under the floor. Uh, we have a series of air channels under the floor, two feet down. And that allows us to heat up not only the concrete on the floor, but the earth underneath that uh, to a height of two feet or four feet, depending on how much warmth there is. And that allows us to store the heat when the sun shines and make use of it when it's a cloudy day. We put a perimeter of eight feet of foam around the outside so that we wouldn't have any frost creep. And that, we found last winter, worked very well. Part of our campus mission is to find different ways that we're able to sustain ourselves without being on the grid and yet desire to be on the grid in part so that we can be selling power back to utilities rather than just taking it from utilities. So in an environment where you've got zero net consumption, you want to be on the grid. You want to be part of that energy flow, but you want to be able to go both ways. You want to draw energy when you need to, but also sell energy back to the utility uh, when it needs it and when you have the capacity. We want to find ways of being able to train people to use these kind of things that we come up with, and that becomes the educational aspect of it. That without advertising or really having anything to sell, we have buses of people coming in, senior citizens, high school students, who just want to learn what we're doing, see what we're doing, experience the feel of cob in their hand, and have an opportunity to understand how this might impact you know, people's lives going forward. It's important for us to create a destination point here where all of the people that have questions can come. They can see these types of, of projects in place. They can see solar being used. They can see the wind uh, mills if we get them in place. They can see cob houses. They can get the feel of them because without feeling it and seeing it, you don't really understand the difference. And that's what we want to bring about is that you can actually see it, feel it, learn about the technologies, learn about the concepts, and actually begin to put them into use yourself. I'm Kerry Nixon, the General Manager of Central Minnesota Ethanol in Little Falls, Minnesota. Our facility is in the process of adding a gasification system that will allow us to comply with uh, US EPA and uh, MPCA and the Department of Justice consent decree that we signed that we would uh, comply with new air permit um, permits that were issued this last year. For 
central Minnesota ethanol to do this would have meant that we added a thermal oxidizer, which would have cost uh, initially a large investment for CMEC. But the biggest uh, challenge there was operating this thermal oxidizer with natural gas. And over the last few years, the cost of natural gas has continued to rise. And we just didn't want to uh, comply with the consent decree without challenging what technology we'd use to, com to get into compliance and to see if we could lower our manufacturing costs. The, the real challenge has been the, the cost of natural gas has uh, quadrupled over the last few years. And with the demand for natural gas, uh, it just didn't seem uh, generally right for us to continue to stay with natural gas. Uh, the ethanol industry itself has been under the microscope for how much fossil fuels we use to manufacture a renewable fuel in the first place. So this this will be our way of uh, improving the energy balance at Central Minnesota Ethanol. So with the help of uh, Sebastian Blomberg Engineering Company and mostly Cecil Massey uh, from the Twin Cities, we have decided to put in a gasification technology which will gasify wood waste. This wood waste will allow us to manufacture a synthesis gas that will be burned and totally replace natural gas. As our objective in working with uh, Central Minnesota Ethanol was to meet their needs to reduce their cost, achieve compliance, and protect their shareholder equity. We chose to do that with a technology that gasifies wood chip to produce essentially a substitute form of natural gas. That gas is then used in a thermal oxidizer to achieve uh, destruction of the VOCs and achieve compliance for the plant on its air permit while also reducing the cost of operation significantly. There are other benefits though that come from using renewable energy to run our ethanol plants. First of all, it eliminates the discussion about whether or not ethanol is truly a renewable fuel. The energy ratio on this plant will be at least three to one by the time we're done. We'll generate nearly a third of the electricity that we need to run this plant, and we will generate all of the thermal energy that we need to run this plant from the uh, wood chips that we bring in. The effect of that is that we will have eliminated the use of natural gas in the production of ethanol at this plant. This back here is the source of the whole problem. This is the distiller's grains dryer, which uh, the vent or the stack gas from this was what was causing a VOC emissions problem for the plant. When the plant is built and the gasification is complete, you can see the plume off the top of the, the column. That will disappear. The ground tanks rising in the back are the, the new distiller's grain storage. And those are a replacement for the existing distiller's grain storage. A large conical uh, vessel behind me is the gasifier. This is a prime energy design. The uh, principle on which it works is that a small amount of air is fed into the gasifier along with the wood chips, causing the wood chips to partially burn, but not completely. That makes a gas called synthesis gas, which then can be used as a substitute for natural gas in the process of the thermal oxidizer and in steam production. The wood waste that we'll be using is, uh, we worked with uh, the DNR, state DNR, and various departments in investigating what fuel source that we could use, and we settled on wood waste. And so we have had a lot of help from various departments in the state of Minnesota to investigate what fuel source we'll use. The ethanol industry has been a great place to start with the idea of using renewables to fuel our industry, primarily because it has a ready access to other renewable supplies such as the distiller's grains and corn stocks. But other industries could benefit from this as well, and we encourage people who are in the process industries to look at ways that they could use their low-value co-products as a replacement for natural gas. The ripple effects that come from using renewable energy that is the best domestically based in Minnesota include, first of all, simply the creation of jobs to carry out that work, but it also assures us that our, our industry will remain cost competitive 
over the long term against both foreign and domestic competitors. I, I think all industry and communities and so forth should look at alternative uh, sources of energy. I think the, the demand for natural gas and uh, so forth is, is continuing to uh, uh, create real stress on a lot of industries. So between uh, solar and wind and biomass and so forth, I think there's a tremendous challenge and tr tremendous uh, uh, opportunity for communities and, and various businesses to utilize what's um, available naturally from, from our earth. My name is Jason Edens, and I work for a nonprofit organization called the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance. And our nonprofit is uh, dedicated to making renewable energy accessible to people of all income levels. And the way we do that primarily is through our solar assistance program, which is solar heat for low income households, households that qualify for fuel assistance. There are two systems on, on the home there's a, a solar forced air system. Uh, which basically heats the, the household air. Uh, whenever, so you can have a very cold winter day. It can be zero degrees or negative 20, but if the sun is shining, you're going to get a tremendous amount of heat um, out of the system. In fact, this particular system will provide 6,500 BTUs per hour when it's zero degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very effective. There's no pollution. There's no emissions whatsoever. And then the other system on this home is a small standalone solar electric system, a photovoltaic system. It's going to be about 250 watts and it'll provide um, all of their electrical needs. So these are the two solar electric panels for, for their home. Um, and interestingly, these two panels are made by British Petroleum. So a lot of the petroleum companies are well aware of the fact that we're reaching peak oil and henceforth there'll be less and less oil production across the globe. But essentially, these guys produce uh, DC electricity, and it is then, of course, sent into the home. And if they have DC loads in the home, they can use the DC power directly, which is efficient because you don't have to convert it into AC. But the actual production of electricity is 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 uh, simpler than than one might think. It looks, you know, almost magical. How does this happen? How is this able to produce electricity from the sun? But the uh, metals that are used to actually make the cells are photoreactive and the electrons in the outer uh, shells of the atoms um, are ex excited when exposed to the sun and they're basically released and it, as that happens you basically capture that release into a circuit. We have installed the solar heating system which is on the south side of the house. It's not quite done yet but we're getting there. It's a really simple system. There's basically um, a black metal with a special paint on it. As it passes across that absorber plate, the air is heated and it can heat up to 20 degrees Celsius as it moves across that, that panel. And then uh, it re-enters the house and this air is circulated over the course of the day. And a system of this size will probably provide anywhere from 25 to 60 percent of their winter heating needs, which is very substantial, especially with soaring fuel costs. This is a clean and inexpensive way to accomplish the heating needs. And we're also working on a solar electric system. This is the balance of system of the solar electric system. Here is the main shutoff for everything. <laughs> on. This will be the charge control. It adjusts how much of the solar panels goes into the batteries, which is going to be in this box right here. And this is just a junction where all the wires get together and Here's a regular panel, just like in everybody's house, only it's going to be DC instead of AC. DC is direct current, like in a flashlight or a car battery, and AC is alternating current, like a blow dryer. And this is the inverter. If they do want a little AC, they can plug in regular appliances into there. There's basically two different types of solar systems. There's a solar electric system and a solar heat system. And then from those two divisions, you can further divide. Uh, a solar electric system is usually one of two types. It's either a battery-based standalone system like this system, or it's a grid interactive system, which is where there's no batteries and all of the power that you um, produce is sent directly into the grid after you've used whatever, um, you know, whatever you're using at the time. And 
And there's lots of state rebates right now for grid interactive systems. In fact, the state will give you $2,000 per kilowatt that you install. And a lot of the utilities are matching that. Minnesota Power matches that, and a lot of the uh, co-ops are matching that as well now. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount of incentives right now for grid interactive solar systems. And there are also some new federal income tax incentives for uh, solar electric and solar heat systems. Now as far as solar heating systems are concerned, there's a hot air system like this one, which is a very simple, low-cost system. And then there's also a solar hot water system rather than air flowing through the collectors, you actually have a heat transfer fluid. And you can heat uh, your domestic water, you can also do space heating. A lot of people are tying these systems into in-floor heat systems, so you can store the heat in the slab. So there's many ways to employ these systems, you know, depending on your site and that type of thing. And we basically sell uh, renewable energy systems to homes and businesses, and we do so on a sliding income scale. And we sell these systems to help us finance our solar assistance program. Because every year the state of Minnesota spends literally tens of millions of dollars on fuel assistance. And fuel assistance simply pays the low income families heating bills. Families who struggle to, to, you know, to pay for their heat essentially. The state will step in and pay their heating bills. And it's a very expensive band-aid but it doesn't provide a long term solution. Whereas our solar assistance program actually does because it gives them the equipment to provide for their own heat. It, it um, empowers the families, it provides self-reliance, and it does all those things with a clean technology rather than a fuel subsidy, which is essentially what fuel assistance is. I said earlier, we are a nonprofit, and uh, we, you know, our primary program is, is one of charity, and so we're always uh, seeking people to help support our work. And by this time next year, we will have an additional uh, 20 solar assistance jobs done and they'll be all across central and north central Minnesota. And we hope to do this all across the Midwest too. I will say that we're not yet adequately funded. Um, the people who are on payroll receive a very, very meager stipend. Um, we get uh, a lot of funding from the Initiative Foundation. We get funding from the University of Minnesota Central Region Partnership. Uh, we've also worked with the clean energy resource teams. They've been very generous as well. But we, as I said earlier, we're always continuing to look for people to help support our work. It's very important work. And uh, using a clean technology to help the lower income families who are struggling to heat their homes is a very appropriate technology. My name is Jay Eidzarek and I live in Ironton, Minnesota with my wife Jody and um, we started making some biodiesel in our garage a few years ago and, and uh, collecting some used restaurant oil uh, and processing that into biodiesel which we used in our little Volkswagen pickup and also in our, uh, our uh, excavating equipment and, um, and after doing that for a couple of years we decided that um, we might take this commercial so that's what we've done. And, um, combined with Ryan Hunt and um, and we're off and running trying to get a biodiesel plant uh, put together here so biodiesel is a diesel substitute uh, made from vegetable oil and, uh, and alcohol you get a, more than three times as much energy out of it as what it takes to farm it grow it and move the soybeans and crush them and move the oil in tank one we mix the methanol uh, the catalyst and the vegetable oil and the reaction happens there, the glycerin settles out to the bottom, the biodiesel then pumped into tank two where uh, the methanol is extracted from it, the excess unreacted methanol. And then in tank three, it's washed with water to carry out any other uh, contaminants. And then it goes out to the product tanks outside. Yes, you can use biodiesel in, in your, uh, your, your personal vehicle or, or in a commercial vehicle. You can tell a vehicle burning biodiesel by the smell. You know, it smells uh, not quite like French fries as opposed to normal diesel, which you will choke and sputter on. Uh, there are no modifications required other than older vehicles that have older rubber components may be susceptible to some uh, some breakdown because of, of the uh, solvent effects um, of the methanol, which is a part of the biodiesel. The emissions from biodiesel are much cleaner than petroleum diesel. Biodiesel is, is run or incorporated into petroleum diesel at, at different ratios. Um, 
In the state of Minnesota, we have what's called the B2 mandate, which says that 2% that, uh, of the diesel fuel that's sold in this state is biodiesel, the other 98% uh, being uh, petroleum diesel. Some stations sell up to a B10 to a B20 mixture. One of the, the uh, considerations with, with biodiesel is that the, the gelling point, or the, or the, the point at which it, it begins to cloud or thicken, um, is, is about 38 degrees. Um, Fahrenheit, and so it has to be uh, uh, dealt with accordingly. Either the vehicle has to be kept warm um, in a garage overnight, um, or um, or it has to be the fuel has to be cut with number one petroleum uh, diesel fuel. Uh, most most petroleum diesel fuel that's sold at a gas station in the winter time is like a 50/50 blend of number two petroleum and 50% number one petroleum. So we we treat biodiesel basically the same way. One of the uh, the things that we have to consider with um, uh, uh, using uh, soybean oil or vegetable oil is, is that um, we need to, uh, it, it, it starts to gel as it gets colder in the winter and, and so what we've done with our, our, our 12,000 gallon uh, storage tank here behind me, the white one, is uh, we've insulated it with five inches of foam shell and then we have a, uh, a copper heat coil inside of it so that we can, we can keep the viscosity of the oil thin enough to bring it into the building. And then also with our, the yellow tank directly behind me is uh, an insulated tank for our product, for our finished biodiesel. Um, once again, <clears throat> uh, we don't want it to get so cold that it starts to gel before we mix it with uh, petroleum. Being a small commercial producer, we're a lot smaller than the next uh, producer in Minnesota. Uh, we hope to sell as much biodiesel as we can locally. And that, uh, most of that we want to sell here actually at our plant, at a retail pump. This is the tank for a retail sales pump. This bright yellow tank is easily visible uh, on the main street here in town, and it's uh, reminiscent of a portable yellow diesel tank. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna be providing fleets around the area, uh, such as the uh, landfill. Uh, they run a lot of diesel equipment, uh, school bus, uh, companies and things like that. What you see behind me, uh, we have a truck loading area. We have the bulk tanks that handle the inputs to the process. Uh, the, in the uh, environmental rules uh, require us to have containment for 110% containment for the largest tank we have. And so we've done that to prevent uh, any spills. Uh, behind here, the big red tanks, one of them's gonna hold the methanol. Uh, another one's going to hold uh, number one diesel to cut it with, and the, the other inputs are in other tanks. Our first goal is to produce 800 gallons a day, and uh, we hope to be doing that uh, within a month uh, before the end of 2005. A uh, large part of this project is uh, using local recycled materials. The uh, office that we see behind us was in a garage that was about to be torn down, and we moved it here and insulated it. Uh, the tanks you see here are all second-hand. Some of them are refurbished. Um, we insulated them. The tanks that we're doing the process in in the other building uh, came uh, second-hand. Biodiesel is made from oil seeds grown in the U.S., grown locally even, and so biodiesel really helps the local economy. By relying more on community-scale renewable energy and energy efficiency, communities can protect natural resources and create local economic development opportunities. People everywhere want strong communities, good jobs, and secure, clean, reliable energy. Central Region CERT members hope that this film will inspire viewers to join their regional clean energy resource team, and they hope that it has provided good information and context for the clean energy projects and leaders within their communities. Finally, they hope that this film inspires viewers to begin clean energy projects in their own homes, businesses, schools, churches, and communities. Together, we can help shape Minnesota's clean energy future.